So my clitoral associated pneumonia, in short, we call it as VAP. So it is a complication of mechanical ventilation, means people who are put on ventilators, and is defined as the occurrence of pneumonia in patients undergoing mechanical ventilation for at least 48 hours. So before this 48 hours, before putting them into ventilation, they were not suffering from pneumonia. But after being kept on ventilation, within 48 hours, they developed pneumonia. Okay, so that's what we call as ventilator-associated pneumonia. Most bacterial nosocomial uh, pneumonia occur by the aspiration of uh, bacteria. Just uh, you already have a colony of bacteria in your oropharynx and even in your upper GI tract. Okay, certain colonies of bacteria are present, but when you aspirate them, when aspirate means when they get into the trachea, okay, and they will start colonizing the lungs. Okay, that's when you get pneumonia. Intubation, the procedure of intubation and mechanical ventilation, okay, it increases the risk of this nosocomial bacteria, bacterial pneumonia because, first of all, they are changing the patient's first line of defense because when you're putting a tube inside your, into, into your trachea, the first line of defense, that is the mucus lining, which is there on the trachea, okay? It is one of the first line of defense, your tears, your nostrils, the mucus lining in your bo body, the gut lining, okay, these all are first lines of defenses in your body. So you are already compromising it by putting a tube inside the trachea, okay? So they cannot, these music, mucus lining will not be able to trap the bacteria. The bacteria will directly get into the lungs and that's how it leads to pneumonia. So prevention, there are certain steps we will discuss here. Hand hygiene, you have to adhere to all the hand hygiene guidelines. Okay, the way how you, the steps of doing hand hygiene, the five moments of doing hand hygiene, it has to be followed by all the healthcare workers who are giving care to the patient, doctors and nurses, okay, physiotherapists, okay, who will be a, a part of the healthcare team. Treating a ventilated patient should follow and adhere to hand hygiene. Healthcare worker should wear mask and an apron, okay, gown. Uh, if you anticipate, you know that you are going to do some suctioning or you are going to uh, treat the patient in such a way that you will be, uh, you are anticipating there will be splashes of respiratory secretions, okay. In such procedures, when you are about to do such procedures, you have to wear mask, gown, apron to protect yourself and also to protect other patients when you move on to other patients like when you are doing intubation when you're doing tra tracheal suction suctioning tracheostomy bronchoscopy okay when these procedures are go gonna be uh, it is gonna happen anticipate that some splashes of the bo patient's body fluid respiratory fluids may happen so protect yourself and change this gowns and uh, apron after procedure. Do the hand washing before you give care to other patient. Elevate the head of the patient who is ventilated 30 to 40 degrees, okay, 30 to 45 degrees as well of the patient, whoever is on mechanical ventilation, because it will reduce the risk of aspiration. When you elevate the head end of the bed to 30 to 45 degrees, the risk of aspiration is reduced. Remove the devices as soon as indicated. As soon as the doctor says that no more ventilation is required, immediately all the devices from the patient's body has to be removed. Like endotracheal tubes, tracheostomy, orostomy, nasogastric tubes. Okay, As soon as it is not indicated, remove it from the patient's body. Perform orotracheal rather than nasotracheal intubation unless it is contraindicated. Okay, Where, wherever possible, always the first choice of mechanical ventilation should be orotracheal route. Use non-invasive ventilation whenever possible, like ampu bag, okay? Whenever it is possible to you give the patient non-invasive ventilation, that should be an option. 
like for half an hour or so, if you can maintain the patient's respiration on an ampule bath, that should be done. Nasogastracheal uh, way has to be avoided because more bacteria, more mucus, and more bacteria will be found. Dust as well is found in the naso nasotracheal route. Okay, less bacteria, less dust is found in the orotracheal route because the mouth usually stays close, but the nostrils are always open because the, because of the mechanism of breathing, right? That's the reason why orotracheal route has to be avoided. First priority is, sorry, nasotracheal route has to be avoided. First, first priority is orotracheal route. Avoid histamine receptor blocking agents or proton pump inhibitors. These are used to prevent acidity. Okay. Uh, if, if the patient does not have a risk of peptic ulcer, stomach ulcer or stress ulcers, Okay, don't don't give them unnecessarily. Don't give them Rantac or, or Omeprazole or these like, this kind of blo blocking agents, which will reduce the acidity. Because you need the stomach to be acidic. Okay, the stomach has to be acidic in nature of the patient. Why? Because the hydrochloric acid is also a first line of defense. Whatever bacteria is coming into the stomach, because of the acidity of the stomach, they are getting killed or neutralized. Okay. But when you put the patient on H2 receptor blocking agents or proton bond inhibitors, it reduces the acidity of the stomach. And when the stomach's acidity is reduced, there are high chances of bacterial growth. And from the stomach, the bacteria can travel up to the esophagus and it can lead to aspiration on a ventilated patients, okay? So that's the reason why you have to avoid it. Regular oral care, especially with an antiseptic solution, you can use betadine here as well, okay? Betadine and uh, gauze piece can be used to brush the area, uh, teeth of the uh, patient, tongue of the patient, okay? You saw an antiseptic solution here to give oral care. Avoid gastric over distension, which means the patient is already on uh, ventilator so tubes are there through the mouth so the patient will not be able to eat food okay so the patient will be put on nasogastric gastric tube ng tube feeding so sometimes what the nurses will do they will overdose the patient with nutrition so that uh, like every two hourly or every three hourly something you have to feed the patient who is on nasogastric tube some nurses if they are too lazy Okay, they will think that, okay, within one shot, we will give uh, 500 ml of feed to the patient so that every two hours we don't have to give, after four hours we can give, okay, to, uh, to save that time. So what happens is that if the stomach is getting over distended, okay, gastro, esophageal reflex can take place, okay, regurgitation can take place, okay, and the stomach is over distended completely full of fluid if the regurgitation takes place regurgitation means escape of the gastric contents into the esophagus and from there if it directly goes into the trachea that will lead to aspiration it could lead to pneumonia okay the first point is don't shut down the acidity of the stomach the stomach has to be acidic in nature so don't give antacids. H2 receptor blocking agents, proton pump inhibitors, these are antacids. Okay. Antacids will reduce the acidity of the stomach. Bacteria will grow. Bacteria can infect the lungs through aspiration. Okay. Remove the condensate from the ventilatory circuits. Change them only when they are visibly soiled or malfunctioning. Condensate formation will happen because the gas is traveling, the air is traveling, cool air is traveling to and fro the ventilators. So uh, the gas that is getting trapped in the pipe, in the circulatory pipes of the ventilator, they will form into a condensate. Okay, they will get hardened. Okay, they will form into this white colored condensate. So they can, uh, they can also sometimes along with uh, some particles of the condensate can travel through the air 
in the ventilator and it can escape into the lungs. It can give further infections. So only when it is visibly soiled, remove the condensate or co completely remove the uh, and change the tubings. Okay. Store and disinfect the respiratory therapy equipment properly. The which means the these condensate tubings, the ventilator circle circuits are there. You have to after a patient has used it, okay. After it has been used on one patient, you have to remove it, disinfect it properly. There are proper steps you, uh, because you cannot put them into autoclave and everything. They are heat labile. You can't put the circulatory circuits of the ventilator into autoclave. You have to go for high level disinfection. Okay, you have to disinfect them and store them properly, dry them completely and store them properly. Educate the healthcare workers and develop a surveillance system. Okay, how, uh, educating the healthcare workers will involve teaching them how to identify signs and symptoms of pneumonia. Okay, when there is a slight temperature change. More exudate is, uh, is uh, getting blocked in the trachea. More and more frequency of suctioning, okay, respiratory suctioning is being done. Patient's temperature is rising. These are early signs of pneumonia, okay. Lot of mucus production is there, early signs of pneumonia. So, keep, uh, make sure your, uh, your staffs know how to identify, okay, uh, the, uh, the signs and symptoms as early as possible. And as soon as you identify them, blood test has to be done to identify which bacteria is causing pneumonia, sputum, sputum test can be done, send the samples to laboratory, let the results come back and based on the bacteria that is infecting the patient in pneumonia, usually it is bacterial infections, antibiotic prophylaxis can be started. Okay, surveillance system, note, note down all the cases of ventilated patients, their signs and symptoms. When did they start the signs and symptoms? When the treatment was initiated? What led to the ventilator-associated pneumonia? Okay, a proper surveillance system will record all these details. Okay, it has to be reported to the Hospital Infection Control Committee. So, is it clear about VAP, the, uh, the care bundles? Next is catheter related bloodstream infection, also called as CLAPSI, central line associated bloodstream uh, uh, inspection. So, it has to be confirmed from the library. Okay, it's a, it's a, the blood sample is given to the library, uh, sorry, to the laboratory. And from the laboratory, you will get the confirmed uh, confirmation that a bloodstream infection is uh, is infecting the patient. The patient is suffering from a bloodstream infection. And uh, when this is confirmed, you have to make note that if the patient is on central line or not. And within 48 hours after the central line has been placed and the patient is suffering from this infection, means it is a healthcare associated infection, okay? And the onset of symptoms is within 48 hours after the patient has been admitted. So follow hand hygiene, same, proper hand hygiene has to be observed. Uh, palpate the insertion side so where the central line has been put and see that there is no swelling, no redness there, okay. Use antiseptic uh, if it is required unless an antiseptic technique is not maintained. In that case, you can use antiseptic uh, solutions there in the site of in, uh, insertion. Antiseptic technique during the catheter, catheter insertion and care has to be followed. Make sure that whoever is inserting the center line, they have, they are wearing sterile gloves uh, during the insertion and uh, the access site is not touched after any antiseptics has been put because you have to clean the area using metadine solution. 
and then you have to insert the catheter and change the dressing uh, of the intravascular catheter using antiseptic solution. Maximum sterile burial precautions during catheter insertion has to be followed, which means the healthcare worker has to wear cap, mask, sterile gloves, gowns, large sterile sheet, a sheet to keep the articles of uh, CVC insertion or P, uh, PVC insertion, guide wire exchange, okay? All this has to be put on a sterile sheet. Strictly follow the catheter site dressing regimens, which means use a sterile gauze piece or transparent or semi-permeable dressing to cover the catheter site. It has to be sterile, the, the area which is touching the patient's wound or the in. Yeah, that is catheters. Uh, in CRBC, it is catheter. But when, it, when you're using flap C, it is central line. CRBSI is catheter related. Flap C, in that full form, it is central line associated. So strictly follow the catheter side dressing regimens. Make sure that you are using a semi-permeable dressing to cover the area where the catheter is placed. If the dressing becomes damp or loosened or visibly soiled, the catheter can be replaced and the dressing can be replaced. Every two days, you can change the dressing. Okay, in short-term CVC site, every two days you can change the dressing. But if it is not visibly soiled, short-term CVT size, every seven days, uh, you can, if you're using transparent dressing, every seven days, once you can change the dressing, except for in pediatric patients, where in pediatric cases, uh, the frequency of changing the dressing is higher. Yeah, for both, the criteria is same. Because children will move around a lot. They will not be conscious about the center line, they will move around the rod. So the dressing may move, it can dislodge, it may loosen, it may get um, uh, like, it may get soiled. So the frequency of changing of uh, changing the dressing in children is higher than adults. You have to monitor the catheter sites visually or by palpation, lightly press the area around the catheter insertion area. If there is pain, Redness, temperature is more in that area, which means there is a start of infection. If any tenderness is there, and if they even if the temperature rise is there, okay, make sure you send the sample, blood sample for laboratory test. Dressing should be removed in such cases, and thorough examination of the site has to be done to rule out any signs and symptoms of infection, any pus formation, etc. Prevention of catheter-related bloodstream infections. Select catheter insertion technique and insertion site, which has the lowest risk for complication, which means as much as possible, avoid the femoral artery. Okay, as much as possible, avoid the groin area or the femoral artery. Avoid femoral vein in adult patients. And use uh, uh, the clavicle region, subclavicle vein, okay, that is more convenient. Immediately remove the central line when it is no longer uh, essential on this within, within half an hour when it is indicated that it is no longer requ required, immediately remove it. Do not routinely replace the center line if uh, just because you want to reduce infection, just for the purpose of preventing uh, central line associated bloodstream infection. If you remove uh, remove the C CVC regularly, replace it regularly, that is not indicated. Okay. Yeah. 
no need to replace the peripheral venous catheter. This is the IV, IV catheters, okay? IV catheters more than uh, uh, more frequently than 72 to 96 hours, which means three to four days, okay? Three to four days, one IV catheter should last at least. Leave the uh, PVC in place in children until IV th therapy is complete because to hold the children down and uh, find the smallest needle and get an IV um, vein in children is much complicated. So at, as much as possible, make sure the PVC is in place in children, okay? Even if it is more than three days, four days, it's fine. If it is if it is not moving, it is if it is attached properly, it's fine. Develop a surveillance system. Conduct surveillance system in units, specifically in uh, critical patient care units who are undergoing ventilation and uh, uh, who are put on central line. So that you can calculate the uh, uh, central line associated bloodstream infection rates. Is it going up or is it coming down in your hospital? So that's about